Welcome to the Sad Crime Channel. Today's story from Germany. It's Tuesday, September 4, 2001. Nine-year-old Dennis Klein is at a resort in the town of Wulzbattel, Germany, Lower Saxony, where he and his classmates arrived the day before on a school trip. The resort is located in the middle of a forest. The children live in a single-story building that consists of two narrow corridors arranged in an L-shape. Along the corridors are doors to rooms. The students enjoy every day of their stay and are in excellent spirits. No one, not even the center's management, knows at this point that this is where a child was sexually abused two years earlier. In the evening, shortly after going to bed, Dennis and his friends, with whom he is also in the room, are playing with a ball. There are seven of them together in one room. At some point, the door opens and a teacher enters their room. She takes the ball and reprimands the children, but does so in a joking tone. She says she would like to take photos as a souvenir and asks each of the boys to sit on the bed. In the photo that the teacher takes of Dennis, the boy holds his beloved Pokemon in front of him. No one at this point suspects what dramatic meaning this moment will soon have. After taking pictures, Dennis reminds the teacher that he is on kitchen duty tomorrow morning. The woman, pleased that the pupil remembers this, says that she will specifically come to wake him up a little earlier. The children continue to play for quite some time as they have no desire to sleep. Around midnight, the teacher makes one last tour of the building. She looks into all the rooms and sees that every child is in bed. She also checks other rooms. Everything is in order, and the children are in their beds and asleep. The teacher will then have the image of a sleeping Dennis in front of her eyes, embracing a Pokemon with his arm while sleeping. The next morning, the teacher goes to Dennis's room to wake him up early. However, his bed is empty. The other boys are still asleep. At first, the woman is sure that the child is already up, so she doesn't worry yet and simply continues her morning rounds. Suddenly, someone tells her that Dennis has not appeared in the kitchen on duty. This news is already alarming. Soon, the teachers and employees of the center start looking for the boy. Unfortunately, he is neither in the building nor anywhere in the center. The teacher recalls that during her nightly rounds, she noticed that a window in one of the empty rooms was ajar. Perhaps Dennis had escaped from the center to his home during the night? It's hard to imagine, especially since the boy left his beloved Pokemon on the bed, and everyone knows that he practically never let it out of his hands. The center staff notify the police. A large-scale search operation is immediately launched. Dennis is searched for by firefighters and police officers with trained dogs. Divers check nearby bodies of water, and a police helicopter joins the search. The media publishes a photo of the child along with information about his disappearance. Since no one comes across the slightest trace of the boy, on September 11th, about a week after his disappearance, the police in Lundberg, Lower Saxony, form a special commission, Dennis. It numbers about 40 people who immediately begin intensive work. September 11th, 2001, is also the day on which the attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon take place. Although the local police are conducting intensive media coverage, Dennis's case gets lost in the flood of dramatic coverage from the United States. Now comes September 19th, at exactly 5.10 p.m., the police receive a report that a man picking mushrooms in the woods near a county road at a location some 30 kilometers from Wulzbüttel came across the corpse of a child. The boy was wearing only his underwear. Police arrive on the scene in no time and secure a large area of land around the site. Experts conclude that the boy was strangled. It soon turns out that he is Dennis Klein, who has been missing for some time. Now the case is making headlines in the media. Journalists discover that two boys were murdered in the region some time ago, and the similarities in the course of events are all too striking. The murdered boys are Stefan Yar and Dennis Rostel. These tragic events took place in Schiesel, Lower Saxony, and at Lake Selker Noor. Schiesel is relatively close to Wulzbüttel, from which Dennis Klein was abducted, while the lake is already a long way away. On Sunday, March 29, 1992, Ulrich Yar drove his 13-year-old son Stefan to the boarding school in Schiesel. He was to pick him up three days later, as spring break was approaching. Bye, Dad, until Wednesday. 
were the last words Ulrich heard from his child. On the morning of March 31st, the boy was found to be absent. The window of the bedroom on the ground floor was open, and Stefan's pajamas were in the waiting room. Other than that, there was no trace of the child. The boy's father searched the dirt roads and barns and such buildings around Schiesel for days. Then all that was left for him was to wait, so he sat on the sofa for weeks, staring at the phone in front of him. Five weeks after Stefan's disappearance, his father received a call from the police. He heard, Mr. Yar, a boy's corpse was found in the dunes of Verdun. We believe it is Stefan. He learned that the child's body showed signs of sexual abuse. The boy was wearing only socks and a t-shirt. In July 1995, eight-year-old Dennis Rostell, who lives in an orphanage, was vacationing at a camping site located on Lake Selker Noor, Schleswig-Holstein, not far from the Danish border. Dennis stayed there together with his friends from the orphanage. The boys spent their time doing sports, swimming, and going on excursions. When the morning of July 24th came, it turned out that Dennis was not in the tent. The boy could not be found in any other place either. The teachers notified the police. On August 8, 1995, in Skive, Denmark, German tourists found the child's corpse buried in the sand. It soon turned out to be the missing Dennis Rostel. Journalists questioned the police, exposing all points in common between the two cases and Dennis's murder. Investigators are not speaking out, stressing that a thorough analysis of all the cases is necessary first, and that takes time. The analysis is ready at the end of November. That's when the police officially release the information that the murders were committed by one and the same perpetrator. This naturally further intensifies media and public interest. On this occasion, the special committee not only raises the issue of the murders, but also includes in the analysis cases of sexual harassment, which also took place in the Bremen area, but are the responsibility of different police stations. What comes to light in the process is frightening. An unknown perpetrator has been practicing his horrific practice in school centers in the Bremen area for many years. The first recorded case occurred in March 1992, 50 kilometers from Bremen. At the Hepstedt School Center, a caretaker spotted a man wearing a balaclava in an empty bedroom. The man escaped through a door leading to the terrace. A few days later, the masked perpetrator again entered the Hepstedt School Center and attempted to sexually abuse an 11-year-old boy there. When the child started screaming, the perpetrator escaped. In March 1992, at a center in the town of Kluvenhagen, a teacher spotted a masked man in the hallway at night and a boy walking by. Having seen her, the man fled. Similar incidents occurred in the following months of 1992, sometimes several incidents in one month. With the names of two centers, Hepstedt and Badenstedt, constantly recurring. To make matters worse, it turns out that years before Dennis Klein disappeared from the center in Wolfsbüttel, children staying there, and quite independently of each other, said they had seen a man wearing a black mask or a balaclava on his head at night. Only now, on the basis of these testimonies and descriptions, scattered in the documentation of many different police stations, is a memory portrait of the man being created. It is known that he acts with unimaginable audacity. He speaks to the children in a kind, reassuring voice such as, Calm down, calm down, sleep on. The perpetrator's toupee is also evidenced by the fact that he also has a record of breaking into private homes. The commission discovers that a masked man has been getting into private homes and molesting boys there since April 1994 in the Bremen area. The special commission also discovers that despite pressure from the parents of the molested children, the authorities failed to issue any warning to the residents of Bremen and the surrounding area. The commission orders a profile of the perpetrator. Special Commission spokesman Detlev Kaldinsky reports that mainly two theories are being considered. The first is that the perpetrator is a pedophile, lives somewhere in the region, and has already come into contact with the police. The second assumes that the perpetrator is somehow connected with school recreation centers. For the investigators, one thing is certain. They are dealing with a serial killer prowling in and around the Bremen area. The fact that the perpetrator's area of operation is relatively large 
is not at all surprising, as specialists point out that such individuals can be highly mobile, following the principle of operating in remote locations. They also often lead double lives, one for show, which is a socially acceptable existence, and another that they must hide from everyone. But despite years of police work, despite public interest and the media, which regularly write about the crimes of the man in the black mask, they fail to get on his trail. The solution, however, comes years later, and from a direction that certainly no one would have expected. It's February 10th, 2011. A 25-year-old Bremen resident, Martin W., sits in his apartment playing on his computer. This grown man experienced something years ago that one never forgets. It was in the fall of 1995, when he was 10 years old. He slept at home in his own room, with his sister and mother sleeping in the rooms next door. As a rule, one's own room and bed is a place where every child feels safe. Meanwhile, this is where the unthinkable happened to Martin. His own words, later uttered during police interrogation, best convey this. During the night I woke up because a strange man was putting his hand under my quilt. He kept saying to me in such a deep voice, I'm not going to do anything to you. He touched me in intimate places. This traumatic event cast a shadow over Martin's life, causing anxiety and depression that dragged on for years, eventually resulting in a months-long stay in a psychiatric hospital when Martin was an adult. He knows that the perpetrator was never caught. As a child, he gave a statement to the police about the case, but as for the perpetrator, he remembered only scraps of information from that night. The outline of a silhouette, black clothing, and nothing else he was able to say. But on this particular evening, February 10th, 2011, while 25-year-old Martin is playing on the computer, he is suddenly confronted with a scene from years ago. A teacher who questions him about what his house looks like, then, as if unsatisfied with what he has heard, asks the boy to draw everything accurately. This incident takes place during the holidays, and Martin is 10 years old and staying at a school vacation center with other children. The 25-year-old Martin sees the scene continue, how, at the teacher's request, he draws the kitchen, then the living room, the bathroom, his sister's bedroom, his mother's bedroom, his own bedroom. This sudden memory is as clear as in the film. Martin feels completely stunned by this sudden return of memories. He remembers talking to someone from the special committee looking for the man in the mask years ago. And he even remembers mentioning a teacher at the time who seemed strange to him and that this was noted. Whereas this extremely vivid memory related to asking about the house and asking him to draw it only appeared now, years later and completely unexpectedly. Martin makes a sudden resolution. He will write an email to the police. In the email, Martin introduces himself, states that he was sexually abused as a 10-year-old, and that after Dennis Klein was murdered, someone from the special committee interviewed him and mentioned that Dennis was certainly murdered by the same man who molested him. In the email, the man also writes that during that interrogation, he gave the name of a teacher whose behavior he perceived as strange at the time. Today, he no longer remembers the name, but it seems to him that the man was also named Martin and that he was his guardian during the holidays. The committee checks the information received and finds the man in question. What Martin W. wrote in the email fits perfectly with all the other pieces of the puzzle, as the potential perpetrator worked as a tutor and already had a record for sexually abusing boys. It is soon clear that the information provided by Martin W. is a breakthrough. In April 2011, Martin A. is arrested. He is a resident of Bremen. At the time of his arrest, he is 40 years old. Almost nothing else is written or talked about in the German media for days. Journalists are trying to answer basic questions. Who is Martin A.? Soon, they manage to gather the most important information. Martin A. was born in December 1970 in Bremen's Schonebeck district. His parents divorced about three years later. The boy grew up with his mother. When he was 16, he was detained by the police. It turned out that over the past few months, Martin had been sending letters to various people, in which he threatened them that if he did not receive a ransom, he would abduct and kill their children. Here is an excerpt from one of the letters. 
If you provide us with 150,000 marks, we will not abduct your children. On the other hand, if you reject our proposal or let the police know, one of the children will die. The 16-year-old blackmailer was sentenced to two months of community service. Since, as a juvenile offender, he received a sentence under the juvenile criminal law, his actions were erased after several years. This means that the police officers investigating the case of the man in the black mask at the time did not have this information, as Martin Ney was officially considered to have no criminal record. At the age of 21, Martin Ney committed his first murder. On the evening of March 31, 1992, he went to a boarding school in Schiesel. He had attended a seminar there a few months earlier. That's when a 13-year-old student, Stefan Yar, caught his eye. Martin Ney abducted the boy. The child's corpse was not found until many weeks later. All the while, Martin Ney, or the man in the mask, led a nightlife, sneaking into school recreation centers and molesting children there. He was seen on numerous occasions, but despite this, he could not be caught. Certainly, both the scattering of information in the various police units already mentioned here and the disregard by teachers and center management for complaints and reports from children contributed to this. Another murder victim was Dennis Rostel. At night, Martinet sneaked into the campground where Dennis was sleeping in one of the tents. When the pedophile began touching him, the boy woke up. The perpetrator intimidated him and disregarding the risk of passport control, traveled with him to Denmark, where he had already rented a vacation home a few weeks earlier. It sounds crazy, but I thought I was a dad at the time the pedophile said during the investigation. He disposed of the corpse in a similar way to the first murder, by burying it in a sand dune. The murderer's life continued normally. A few days after the murder of Dennis Rostel, training footage was produced in which the educator pedophile conducts first aid exercises with children. In the video, Martin Ney can be seen at one point standing right next to 10-year-old boy. It is only now, years later, that the police have determined that this boy is Martin W., who must have been brought to the attention of the educator pedophile by then. It is also now known that an incident took place within the next few days of the filming of this video, which Martin W. unexpectedly recalled years later. After Dennis Klein's murder, the pedophile continued to remain elusive and continued to act with impunity despite the fact that he came to the attention of the police in subsequent years for a number of sexual abuses. But investigations against him were always dropped, for example, because the statute of limitations had run out on the act, or he was only fined. Also, a little later, the information that the special committee Dennis was taking Martin A into consideration as a potential man in a black mask and even interrogated him about it is leaking to the public. In addition, the notes of the interrogating police officer showed that Martin Ney perfectly matched the profile of the perpetrator available to the commission. And one more thing. Although Martin Ney refused to give a saliva sample for testing at the time, this drew no one's attention, and this thread was never picked up later. Thus, the perpetrator again managed to slip through the sieve of justice. He was already taking full advantage of the benefits of the increasingly ubiquitous Internet and was contributing extensively to pedophile forums. In October 2011, the trial begins. The defendant confesses to the three murders he is charged with, as well as to other acts. In February 2012, Martin A is sentenced to life imprisonment. He is serving his prison sentence in a correctional facility in Chella, Lower Saxony. In 2019, the man in the black mask is again in the news, as his name is linked to the case of missing Madeline McCann, but this thread is rather quickly ruled out. In turn, in January 2021, Martin Ney is temporarily transferred to a prison in France, where police are investigating the case of a 10-year-old boy who was murdered in Brittany in 2004. The boy was abducted at night from a building where he and other children were staying during a school trip. This crime has been linked to the person of Martin Ney, as he allegedly confessed to a fellow inmate that he was the perpetrator of this murder as well as four others for which he was never charged. As it turns out, 
The circumstantial evidence gathered was not enough for the French prosecution to bring an indictment. Thus, the convict, who, by the way, does not admit to the new crimes, returns to prison in Shell in September 2021. The story of the man in the mask continues to arouse great emotions in Germany to this day, as it perfectly illustrates the actions of law enforcement agencies, the judiciary, as well as institutions operating within the framework of education. As you can see, the pedophile murderer managed to practice his criminal activities for more than 20 years with practically no consequences.